Our next question is from Asha, and she actually had a friend who is Muslim bring up these two questions. And one, the first one is, he believes that Muhammad is prophesied in Song of Songs. He said that the word beloved in Hebrew is Muhammad. He said that Christians are saying that these are different words. However, her question is, are the two words Muhammad in Arabic and beloved in Hebrew related linguistically? And second, she also said her friend asked uh, her who is the prophet in John one twenty one. He's implying that it is sure. Muhammad. Yeah. Well, just like there's Christian Middle Earth, where there's all sorts of wacky stuff said about the Bible, there's Islamic Middle Earth, too, okay, where you get wacky stuff either said about the Quran or in an apologetic appeal with respect to Islam. Um, I, ha I hate to put it this way, but I'm just going to be blunt. This is nonsense. You know, first, Arabic as a written language dates to a period well after the composition of the Song of Solomon or the Old Testament just generally. What used to be spoken and written was something that scholars call South Arabian. And South Arabian was contemporary with the biblical period, but classical Arabic, as in the Quran, dates to the Common Era, AD, if, if you will, or CE. The earliest argument and this is sort of an extreme view of, of, of people within ling, you know, this linguistic inquiry, is that classical Arabic is as old as 100 BC, which is still much later than the Old Testament, centuries later. Yet, let, let's recall when the Quran was written. Okay, the 500s AD. You know, so you know, classical Arabic existed when the Quran you know, comes along, but it had not existed for very long. It, it's a literary language. And, you know, it, again, th there, there's no one-to-one -one correspondence here. There's also a semantic problem, though. So you have a, a, a language history problem. You have a semantic problem. The Hebrew for beloved, and all you got to do is look at this in a, in a concordance or, you know, a software or whatever, in, you know, these passages is dod. The literary Arabic equivalent would be Dad, which means foster father, or play as in making a joke. So, no, it doesn't share the same meaning, and it certainly doesn't mean Muhammad, okay? And I doubt this person, you know, Asha's Islamic friend, would want to say that Muhammad was a joke or something to be trifled, you know, at, someone to be trifled with or at. So that you got a, you got a history problem in the language, you got a semantic problem. When it gets, comes to John one twenty one, we might as well just um, read that. John one twenty one. Let me scroll up here just a verse. I'll go to, up to verse nineteen. This is the testimony of John. Okay, this is John the Baptist. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, "Who are you?" He confessed and did not deny, but he confessed, "I am not the Christ." And here's verse twenty one. And they asked him, well, what then? Are you Elijah? He said, I'm not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, no. So the question is, you know, who is the prophet here? And, and again, the, the Asha suspects her friend is angling that this prophet is Muhammad. Well, doesn't, wouldn't that make this, the question utter nonsense? Okay, because if John is writing 500 years before Muhammad is born, how would it refer to Muhammad? So that's one problem. It's also not worded as any prophecy, but it is tied into an Old Testament prophecy. And so maybe Asha's friend knows that there's, there's prophecy in the picture here. And that, it harkens back to Deuteronomy 15, uh, excuse me, Deuteronomy 18, verse 15. And this is the, uh, the passage, you know, a prophet like unto Moses, all right? Here, I'm going I'm to quote verses 15 through 18 because there's something in here that obviously is going to divorce this from Muhammad. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me. This is Moses again speaking to the people. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen. Just as you desired of the Lord your God at Horeb, i.e. Sinai, on the day of the assembly, when you said, 
let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God or see this great fire anymore, lest I die. And the Lord said to me, they are right in what they have spoken. Here's verse 18. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers. And I will put my words in his mouth and he shall speak to them all I command him. What's the significance of the prophet that God will raise up from among their brothers? This is spoken at Sinai. He's a Jew. Okay, the prophet that Deuteronomy looks forward to is a Jew. So that kind of rules Muhammad out. <laughs> um, there are no Muslims in the Old Testament, obviously, because Muhammad isn't born until centuries after the close of the Old Testament period. And it's also centuries after the New Testament period as well. Now, immediately, of course, we know that Deuteronomy 18 is fulfilled with Joshua. Joshua. Yeshua. Hmm, where have I heard that? Oh, yeah. You know, this is, this is the name, of course, of Jesus, Jesus, in the New Testament, and Jesus in the Septuagint. And, and those two things are designed, you know, to align with each other both historically, literarily, and, and just, you know, to ring in the ear of anybody who's going to hear this, especially when Jesus starts preaching and it becomes known, you know, who this guy is. This has nothing to do with Muhammad. It's centuries, you know, irreconcilable. Muhammad wasn't a Jew. He's not from the tribes of Israel. I mean, it's it just, it's utter nonsense. It makes no sense at all. So, um, no. <laughs> like I said, there's also Islamic Middle Earth along with Christian Middle Earth and just secular Middle Earth. Lots of crazy stuff on the internet that you'll run into that you can just safely ignore and disregard.